Jeff Weiss, um, back with the lecture materials for Unit 14. We're going to be talking about sustainability and uh, how sustainable agriculture fits into the bigger picture of uh, ethical food production. Um, so, I hope this um, lecture involves quite a few slides, so I hope to move through them rather quickly. But if you have any um, uh, questions or comments to make. I hope you'll make them in the um, discussion board or uh, uh, send me emails. I'm interested in your comments uh, on this uh, topic. So what we're going to focus on is areas where current agricultural practices can cause environmental harm and talk about some of the practices that can uh, uh, address uh, not just the environmental harm but the economic and social consequences that go with uh, uh, our food production, distribution, and consumption systems. It's kind of a very broad topic that leads into uh, other coursework uh, that's offered at, uh, at the CLC Horticulture. And I hope uh, you're looking into or taking classes from uh, uh, Gianna on sustainable agriculture or other um, programs where you can get more into these ideas. Anyway, uh, talking not specifically uh, this time about organic agriculture, organic horticulture, but rather the uh, uh, even broader uh, theme of sustainable agriculture. Um, and with that comes another um, discussion of uh, industrial or conventional agriculture, uh, not to demonize those people because uh, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, incentives in our whole food production system that drive uh, farmers, uh, uh, conventional farmers, into the practices that they take. And many of them are experimenting with uh, approaches and uh, looking to um, make their practices more sustainable, consistent with uh, earning a living on their land. We're going to look at the impact of um, agriculture and horticulture on biodiversity. And we're going to get a little bit into the ideas of uh, uh, more healthy of, uh, food systems uh, and um, a couple of ideas uh, about food miles and food access. So what is sustainable agriculture? It's a way of raising food that is uh, healthy for consumers and animals because most of our food um, uh, at least most of our corn crop uh, is fed directly to cattle and other animals. Uh, and these practices uh, are um, designed not to harm the environment, to be humane for workers uh, and animals, uh, provide uh, an adequate uh, a wage or living uh, to workers uh, in the agriculture sector, and um, uh, support the communities uh, where farms occur. So these ideas integrate three main goals, uh, environmental health, um, economic profitability, and social and economic equity. Um, this is very uh, complicated, deep stuff, and I hope you'll give some thought to the implications of, uh, of our uh, actions uh, as horticulturalists and as uh, consumers of food products uh, as we go through this. So uh, again, I kind of setting up a straw man here as I did last week with uh, industrial agriculture. Um, but here I'm going to take up a couple of slides on non-sustainable uh, practices. So here we have a very common scene out in the farm country where tankfuls of anhydrous uh, uh, ammonia get um, injected into the soil uh, to begin the um, uh, spring planting season. Um, millions of uh, tons of this product are injected into the soil to produce the um, uh, amazing uh, crop yields that we get uh, frequently over 200 bushels per acre in uh, uh, Illinois and, Ohio and Iowa, the heart of farm country. Uh, but that uh, productivity comes at a cost. Um, frequently, the um, uh, these fertilizers um, 
escape uh, into the atmosphere without uh, uh, fertilizing the soil. They uh, can wash off into uh, drains and uh, stream get into streams, lakes, and rivers and uh, harm aquatic organisms by depleting the oxygen content of the water and uh, perhaps most uh, distressing uh, over over time these heavy injections of uh, excessive fertilizers harm the uh, microorganisms and the um, ultimately the health of the soil so that um, as more and more um, fertilizers and pesticides uh, shown on the chart on the right get applied to the soils uh, they ultimately um, uh, break down the um, fertility of the soil and um, lead to ever uh, heavier applications in order to get the same uh, same results over time these practices uh, over and practiced over most of our agricultural land are not sustainable over the long term. Another uh, example, in my opinion, of non-sustainable agriculture practices are the um, CAFOs, the concentrated um, uh, animal production facilities, um, uh, where uh, literally hundreds of thousands of cattle, pigs, turkeys, chickens, uh, are raised in very very close proximity to each other under um, uh, questionable uh, uh, conditions. Uh, they create vast amounts of animal waste uh, which um, uh, because they cannot uh, be applied as uh, manures locally uh, become toxic waste and um, also release uh, large amounts of uh, nitrogen uh, and uh, phosphates into the air and water uh, where they cause um, significant uh, water pollution and overall in our world now um, the amount of food uh, is coming from fewer and fewer plants and animals and uh, those uh, plants and animals are being raised in ever larger more concentrated uh, monocultures and um, if you have studied ecology uh, you know that uh, monocultures are the antithesis of biodiverse ecosystems and monocultures are um, almost always uh, are by definition um, out of balance and cause uh, environmental environmental harm so anyway um, this concentration of uh, plant and animal um, dietary items um, works out so that now uh, just 14 species of animals and birds supply 90% uh, of the human diet of animal derived foods and similarly in the area of plant culture uh, 12 crops uh, account for more th than three quarters of the world's uh, diet and just three of them um, more than half of the world's food corn rice and uh, wheat uh, supply more than half of the total amount of food consumed in the world. So sustainable agriculture can improve um, land stewardship, watershed management, air quality, and uh, many other uh, can achieve many other um, uh, good things for people and our planet. And I'm going to go through some of those uh, topic by topic uh, in the following slides. So the first thing is open space. Um, open space uh, uh, provides benefits to the environment. Um, trees reduce temperatures and stormwater runoff. They absorb solar radiation and promote clean air. And you could say the same thing about prairies and wetlands. They all um, play a, a, an important role in um, creating uh, uh, diversity of plants and animals um, and provide these uh, incredibly val valuable uh, environmental services. Um, so our suburbanized uh, landscape uh, definitely uh, reduce the amount of open space as do our many of our farm practices. So in the case of uh, our agriculture, as farms have gotten larger and larger, um, they have um, taken out 
the um, smaller uh, fields and the fence rows between fields that provided um, uh, habitat for birds and animals uh, and uh, trees. And what we see now when we drive across uh, the farm belt in Illinois is um, the old farm roads a mile apart, but uh, continuous fields, uh, in many cases, across that entire mile. And so what's happened is that when there were 120-acre uh, farms, each farm had its own uh, uh, fence rows and uh, breaks between fields uh, where wildlife could could thrive. And now those, as uh, farm ownership has become more and more concentrated, um, those fence rows have disappeared along with them. All of the nest uh, nesting uh, sites for birds and as a result uh, many of our common um, species such as uh, um, redhead woodpeckers, uh, bobolinks, uh, meadowlarks, have, uh, their populations have crashed. Uh, it's not as simple as changes in the farm, um, in the structure of farms, but um, the uh, uh, impact of our unsustainable practices have led to um, loss of dramatic losses of many of the familiar um, uh, species, not just of birds, but of uh, reptiles and mammals uh, across uh, across our land. Water availability is a huge uh, issue. Um, water resources are already scarce. Many areas um, were blessed in the Midwest with abundant rainfall and uh, uh, shallow um, aquifers uh, that have um, good supplies of groundwater uh, and the Great Lakes which many of us use as our drinking water source. However, those resources are not available in many parts of the U.S. that are undergoing heavy uh, agricultural use and even in our own uh, areas groundwater tables are uh, dropping uh, rapidly in some areas and are becoming um, uh, polluted with uh, salt and other uh, other chemicals. Uh, so all of these factors are um, pushing us in the direction of making much more careful use of uh, of water as a resource for irrigating our uh, food crops and uh, uh, developing better practices to uh, reduce the pollution that comes from uh, uh, runoff from uh, rain and irrigation systems. So water quality is related to the water quantity issue and uh, uh, some of the most uh, critical issues related to water quality involve contamination of groundwater and surface water. Um, nitrates and phosphates are the pollutants that are uh, washing into our rivers and streams being carried down, um, in, in our case, the Illinois River into the Mississippi and out into the Gulf of Mexico where those uh, pollutants are causing um, the dead zone or the epoxy in the Gulf of Mexico. Many of you have perhaps heard of the uh, uh, dead zone where no um, fish or aquatic life can live. Uh, sometimes that dead zone ex extends well into the Gulf of Mexico from the uh, Mississippi River Delta and those problems can be traced up the Mississippi River to Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin uh, where some of the worst um, uh, pollution is getting into our uh, waterways. So some of the practices that can be used to reduce um, this problem is to keep uh, farm animals out of our streams and waterways uh, and keep them from uh, uh, defecating and causing uh, uh, extreme uh, pollution to these waters. A second practice is to um, create buffer zones and um, uh, areas of vegetation uh, between the um, fertilized fields and the waterways and these uh, this vegetation will uh, slow down erosion and filter out the nutrients uh, from the uh, fertilizers that are being applied to um, reduce the amount of pollution getting into our uh, into our water. In addition uh, salinity uh, uh, is the concentration of salts from evaporation of irrigation water is a huge problem in the southwest. Um, 
not so much of an issue in the Midwest, but ultimately um, much of our food comes from places in uh, uh, Texas, California, uh, Washington, um, Idaho, Colorado um, that are uh, heavily irrigated and the uh, uh, loss of water resource and the um, uh, pollution of the uh, irrigation water is uh, threatening um, the long-term productivity of uh, much or most of the farmland in the U.S. Without sustainable practices, uh, um, those areas will return to the arid uh, desert-like regions that they once were. So how do we protect uh, these uh, water resources? Well, um, better water conservation and storage. Um, uh, in, in particularly, uh, water conservation is uh, going to be important um, because our um, groundwater supplies are dropping um, uh, much more quickly than they're re being replenished by, um, by rain and storm water. Uh, incentives for using drought tolerant crop species. Uh, corn and soybeans are very uh, water intensive. Uh, but some other uh, some other uh, crops are being uh, uh, developed. Uh, some amaranths and other um, uh, species. Uh, sorghum is another example of a species that has is much less um, uh, water intensive in its production, and can uh, perhaps be used as a substitute for. Um, corn and soybeans and feeding some of our uh, some of our animals. Uh, reduced volume irrigation, uh, managing crops to reduce their uh, amount of water loss or, and is frequently occurring, uh, uh, putting uh, uh, areas into the um, conservation uh, programs and, and not growing crops on them or uh, leaving them fallow and allowing the uh, um, the um, soil moisture to recover for a year are good conservation practices that are being employed in um, many areas uh, in the farm belt, particularly in the uh, Great Plains and some of the uh, western states. Air quality. Um, yeah, our uh, agricultural practices affect air quality. Uh, smoke from uh, burning, dust from tillage, traffic, uh, and harvest, uh, pesticide drift from spraying, and nitrous oxygen uh, emissions from the use of nitrogen fertilizer. And to this list I would add um, um, feedlots, or these concentrated an animal uh, feed feeding operations, um, the uh, thousands of cattle uh, defecating on the ground and then um, getting that uh, uh, material uh, stomped and, and blown around by air creates huge plumes of nitrogen um, uh, drift uh, and uh, um, these uh, nitrogen plumes uh, coming from these uh, feedlot operations have um, increased the amount of nitrogen getting into the streams and lakes uh, uh, across the Midwest. So air quality uh, doesn't just affect the air because those things that get into the air come down and they can cause um, uh, acid rain in the northeast and uh, excessive uh, uh, levels of nitrogen in the uh, uh, soils and groundwater of the Midwest. So some options to improve air quality include incorporating crop residue into the soil. Um, that is using uh, manures uh, and uh, using the animal products uh, to enrich the soil rather than these artificial inputs of anhydrous nitrogen and, and rock phosphate. Um, using appropriate levels of tillage, uh, that means don't plow and turn over the soil, uh, just break up uh, the soil using uh, uh, disking or no-till, and then planting windbreaks to reduce erosion, cover crops as you saw in the video from last week, um, to um, keep uh, to reduce the amount of erosion and strips of native perennial 
uh, grasses uh, to reduce the amount of uh, wind and dust coming off the land. Uh, soil degradation we talked about uh, um, or I mentioned earlier the uh, bad effects of fertilization and um, uh, pesticide use um, and the soil deg degradation is the loss of potential for productive use of the land. Um, it, soil degradation over time uh, results in reduced yields uh, or higher costs and decreased efficiency of adding nu nutrients. And in some ways over time the more you fertilize uh, the more harm you cause, the more degradation you cause to the soil, which in turn requires uh, even more fertilization in the future to uh, uh, provide the same, um, same crop. So it's time to break that paradigm and um, look at other uh, means of um, fertilizing and enriching the soil. So in addition to loss of uh, soil fertility, uh, physical loss of soil um, due to wind and water erosion are huge problems. Um, the photo on the left was from the Dust Bowl in the 1930s and there's absolutely no guarantee that the uh, conditions that caused the Dust Bowl in the 1930s could not return in the 2000s. Even though some of our uh, uh, practices have changed um, the combination of weather and exposed soils that occurred then could reoccur now. And um, in, in many places uh, where soils are left bare through the winter, uh, this kind of water erosion uh, can uh, result in uh, loss of soil and the um, uh, creation of gullies and uh, um, the water, the, the soils that get washed out of this land are ending up in streams and lakes as uh, sediment and causing uh, further damage uh, through that process. So um, sustainable agriculture um, views the soil as a fragile and leave, living medium to be protected and nurtured over the long term. Uh, and some of the methods uh, to protect soils including cover crops, uh, using compost and manures, reducing tillage, avoiding traffic on wet soils which uh, compacts them and uh, uh, eliminates the pore spaces uh, needed to store uh, 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 gases and uh, uh, water in the soil, and maintaining uh, uh, soil cover with crops and or mulches. So what we're looking at in this photo is uh, residue from prior crops uh, being left on the soil um, and, and these residues hold in uh, uh, soil moisture and uh, as they break down they add fertility to the soil. So much more of this uh, sustainable agriculture is needed in order to uh, reverse the trends of the past um, 100 years or more of uh, intensive uh, agriculture and some of these harmful practices. Energy usage is a big uh, issue in our farm uh, economy. Um, we are heavily dependent on non-renewable uh, sources, especially petroleum. Um, even though a lot of energy now is being produced in the Midwest uh, through fracking and uh, shale, uh, oil shale, um, uh, over the very long term, energy uh, will be a um, continue to be a, um, uh, an issue and uh, there are sustainable practices that can dramatically uh, reduce the inputs of energy required to produce a crop. So um, here are some uh, alternatives, um, especially those where farmers rely on natural, renewable, and on-farm inputs. Uh, renewable energy sources um, are all um, practices that will reduce the uh, reliance on petroleum and um, some of this is just good management and use of scientific knowledge and substituting them for uh, the, the cheap abundant energy that's been uh, available to us for the last uh, 50 years or so. The goal is to develop um, biological natural systems that do not need high levels of 
these uh, oil-based um, inputs, both uh, fuel required for uh, equipment and then the, uh, since many of the synthetic um, fertilizers and pesticides are also petroleum-based, reducing these also reduce um, uh, oil um, uh, consumption. So biodiversity, um, current industrial agriculture favors uh, genetic monocultures of just a few crops as we talked about before. Uh, deforestation to clear land for agriculture is one of the leading causes of biodiversity loss. But as I mentioned earlier, just taking out fence rows uh, has eliminated huge amounts of cover for um, uh, plants and animals uh, that add biodiversity to um, our farm belt. Uh, conservation and promotion uh, through sustainable agriculture. And the idea here is to integrate crops and livestock into the same farming operation. We've gone the opposite direction. We've created these vast uh, uh, corn deserts, corn and soybean deserts. And in uh, other areas, we've created these uh, mammoth uh, uh, feedlots. And we've taken the animals off the farm, and we've taken the, uh, the plants off the, uh, off the ranch, and to the detriment of both. So uh, maintaining plant di diversity in and around uh, riparian and agricultural areas helps support diverse animal or wildlife uh, and aids in uh, um, natural processes such as uh, pollination and pest management. We'll get back to pollination in a little bit. Uh, so agriculture has uh, resulted in uh, habitat destruction but has also created huge uh, pollution levels um, that threaten uh, uh, fish, uh, animals, birds, and uh, uh, all of the other um, living members of our of our planet. Then there's the impact of agriculture on the surrounding communities. Um, many of our uh, farm communities have uh, become uh, uh, fragmented and uh, weak communities um, I guess I don't know how much how much uh, you follow this but uh, uh, crack and cocaine have become uh, huge uh, issues in some of the small uh, farming communities uh, because of the lack of uh, employment prospects and uh, um, prosperity and the loss of cultural life in these communities uh, so that affects the economic viability of our uh, uh, of our um, farming areas, and then in our urban areas, there's issues of food access and land use, uh, particularly with the abandonment of a lot of uh, uh, urban, um, industrial, and residential areas. Um, and uh, there's a lot going on in trying to recreate these areas, redevelop these areas, and, and to um, develop sustainable land use applications for them. So on the topic of food access, um, the world is uh, just past 7 billion on its way to 9 billion population. And frankly, some of our government policies run uh, totally counter to the goals of sustainable agriculture and feeding that population. Uh, commodity and, and price support programs through the current par farm bill uh, pay farmers uh, without consideration sometimes to the environmental repercussions or the food supply. And in the current farm bill, uh, Congress is trying to uh, uh, strip out uh, funding for food stamps and other programs that will um, help our um, poorest citizens uh, get the nutrition that they need. Uh, um. So, uh, in in response to some of this, um, food, uh, uh, local food production and local food consumption uh, have become um, ethical um, considerations. And uh, you've probably heard the term locavores. That's uh, a term for people who try to eat as much of their food as possible from local sources. Well, how local can your food get? Um, there's two dimensions to the local food issue. Um, 
and the first one is how far did your food travel from the uh, uh, field where it was raised to uh, your fork. Uh, that's called food miles and uh, in, in many of our food products uh, food, uh, especially fruit, is brought in from hundreds or thousands of miles away um, and there is really a global uh, marketplace for horticultural products especially fruit and flowers. So that's the first uh, the first dimension. The second one is uh, how far do people have to go to get decent food and that is uh, uh, the idea of food deserts and in uh, many of our urban areas uh, uh, in, in neighborhoods uh, there is not access to um, good healthful nutritious food uh, locally uh, instead um, sometimes convenience stores and uh, very expensive uh, 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 markets are the only place where uh, food can be purchased leading to um, uh, overconsumption of um, uh, fatty um, uh, uh, low nutrition uh, food uh, also known as convenience food so for food miles, um, where the food goes from where it's grown uh, to where it's ultimately purchased or consumed is the idea here. Um, and uh, calculations in a 1980 study uh, looking at this, and things have changed a lot since 1980, estimated that fresh produce, uh, fruits, and vegetables uh, travel on average 1,500 miles uh, to the uh, store where they're purchased. Um, there's an article on the... Uh, uh, Iowa State website uh, cited here that talks about uh, uh, distances uh, for uh, foods from their, uh, where they're grown to, to uh, Iowa. Uh, but you may want to take a look at that and uh, uh, get a better understanding of where your food comes from. And then there's the uh, land use issue um, and we're seeing this uh, in, in Lake County. Um, where pro-development uh, policies discourage uh, local farmers from adopting sustainable practices in a long-term perspective. Uh, why would someone want to stay in farming when they can cash out on their land and see it turned into uh, uh, subdivisions and strip malls? Well, it seems unfortunate to me that some farms cannot be preserved uh, uh, as uh, local food sources and as cultural um, uh, locations where people can uh, uh, stay in touch with the um, uh, with local food sources and the um, incredibly important history and culture of agri of, of uh, from our agricultural heritage. Um, however, none of those uh, incentives are currently in place, and so we continue to. Uh, plow out our farmland and turn it into uh, McDonald land. So uh, there's a couple of sources of additional information, websites that I'm giving you here. One is the Agricultural Sustainab Sustainability Institute at the University of California, Davis. Uh, their website is an excellent source of information on sustainable agriculture and sustainable practices. And we also have the Alternative Farming Systems Information Center, uh, which helps identify resources about sustainable food systems and practices. Um, and the USDA is uh, coming aboard in some ways in efforts to um, develop a more sustainable future for agriculture and farmers worldwide. So that's my material, but um, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing your uh, posts on the work being done at um, Prairie Crossing. I know uh, uh, some of you are familiar or even involved in the work that's going on there, and that will be the combined assignment for Lessons uh, 13 and 14. Uh, and we're down to our last uh, two lessons here. I hope you've uh, uh, been enjoying this uh, material as much as I've been enjoying uh, seeing your posts and uh, looking at your work. And I hope you'll continue your uh, uh, informing yourself and your study on this uh, on these important topics. 
Um, that's it for assignment or unit 14, and uh, we'll wrap up next week with the final uh, lecture for the class.